This week in the Book of Mormon, we are we will be discussing Mosiah chapters 18 through 24. We're going to review a little historical context and, and do a little bit of the content in here uh, this week. I want to start with a verse from a uh, previous week's reading that I think would be lead us into today's discussion a little bit more effectively. If you would please go to Mosiah chapter 11. Mosiah chapter 11. If you'll recall here, King Noah is the wicked king in this case. And he is surrounding himself with some uh, really bad people who are telling him how great he is. And he doesn't want to hear anything, and they don't want to hear anything except how great they are. In Mosiah chapter 11, verse 29, it says, Now the eyes of the people were blinded. And then it says, Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts against the words of Abinadi. So I have here a pair of blinders. You'll see these if you're on an airplane or a bright room and you need to have it dark. You just put the blinders on. And you really can't see, and you can close and your eyes and sleep. And the world of reality around you disappears. That's kind of what these people were doing. The world of reality, they didn't want to see it. They just wanted to know how great and how wonderful they were. And they wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. Now, these you really can't see through. Maybe blinders might look something more like a pair of glasses. Uh, we use the phrase in English, rose-colored glasses. You put them on, all you see is rosy things. Or maybe the best description of blinders might be the kind that uh, they put on horses that block out the peripheral vision so you only see what's right in front of your face. Nonetheless, however you want to envision blinders is the people wanted to hear Noah be their king and just say, we're the best people in the world. We're the greatest. We're invincible. We just defeated the Lamanites in battle and we're the best. Well, what you're going to see today is uh, that falls apart and the blinders come off and they have to see reality for what it really is. So let's take a look at some uh, of our background for a moment here. Here's a, a chart that I've shown numerous of times. Uh, the people from Lehi all the way down until where we're at here. So we're just going to zoom in with this section right here. We have the land of Nephi, which is in the south. Uh, Zenith first went down there. Uh, he has now moved on, and his son Noah is the wicked king. And he's leading the people into some horrible things. We know that Abinadi came and preached to Noah. And it was Alma who left, who believed in Abinadi, who left and fled to his own little uh, group and started preaching people, followed him. They gathered there at the waters of Mormon. We also know that Noah was killed eventually, and we'll get to that today. Ammon was sent by King Mosiah to go find these people, finds Limhi, and sees that Limhi's people are in bondage. And we know that one of Noah's wicked priests was Amulon, and he departs, flees, he escapes. Though Noah gets killed, Amulon uh, is free, actually comes into contact with the Lamanites and becomes a leader of these Lamanite people, convinces them that they need to go do all these horrible things. They find Alma's people and put Alma's people in a temporary bondage. So we know that Limhi's people are in bondage, but Ammon is going to help them escape. In other words, they need a deliverer, a type of Christ, as we've mentioned before. And we know that Alma people, Alma's people need to escape. They don't have a special deliverer. They have a different way that they're going to escape. So today we'll talk about how two groups of people, Limhi's people and Alma's people, will escape. Eventually they will all escape back to the land of Mosiah. So let's take a look at a few things here. If you'll go to Mosiah chapter 18, please. Mosiah chapter 18. We'll start right from the beginning. Now here we're talking about Alma fleeing Noah. 
he repents and he will privately teach about the people. And that's all in verse one there. At verse four is interesting. The name of the place is Mormon. Now remember, who's abridging this record? It's Mormon. And this is the first time we see the name Mormon appear in the record. So do we know if Mormon was named after this land? I, I don't know. But Mormon pays, obviously, close attention. It's his namesake. Uh, so the name Mormon is mentioned over and over and over. Uh, the, the land was Mormon. The water was Mormon and everything around there. So it's great that Mormon sees this and he, he writes this. It's interesting to him. Plus, it's a type of Christ. Again, everything in the Book of Mormon is to bring us closer to the Savior. So here we have a fountain of pure water that you submerb, uh, submerse yourself in it through baptism to become take upon you the name of Jesus Christ, to become cleansed, that you might live with him and like him someday. Uh, it's great, great things in there. The fountain's pure water, that's verse 5. And then verses 8 through 13 is all about the baptismal covenant. Uh, what would be a great family activity or, or an individual activity to do here is take a piece of paper and make a little a T uh, chart on your paper. And on the top, just write baptismal covenant. And then on the left side, write what is required of me or uh, personal requirements. And just go through verse by verse. For example, it says, you must be desirous to come into the fold. You must be willing to bear one another's burden. So I write, okay, what does the Lord expect of me at my baptismal covenant? Well, I have to have a desire to come into the fold. I have to bear one another's burden. And then on the other side, you write, well, what are the blessings from doing that? For example, it's listed that you will come forth in the first resurrection. You will be, your burdens will be lightened. Why? Because everyone's trying to help you lighten their burdens. Uh, this is a great family activity to have a discussion about baptismal covenant. So I hope you have that. Plus, there's some things in the Come Follow Me book that will be helpful for you to it as well. Now, verse 12 is interesting because Alma takes Helam and wants to baptize him first. And if you'll notice, they both go in the water and they both go under the water. So the question comes up is, where does Alma receive his uh, authority to baptize? He was one of the wicked priests. And remember, Noah got rid of the righteous priests of, of Zenith and displaced him with his wickedness. Well, obviously, Alma has a priesthood authority in here probably, we don't know this, but he probably received it either from his father or from one of the righteous priests, but chose to rebel, just like sometimes today in the church. We have people who make bad choices and they rebel. And when they're brought back into the church, their priesthood authority can be restored or is activated through righteousness. The power's there. So, but he wants to make a covenant and be rebaptized. Now, this is not a baptism for entrance into the church. At least it does not appear that, A, because he's already a church member. Helam probably is too. In fact, all of these people probably are. They're children. They're the second generation, so they were probably baptized by those who have the authority. This appears to be a rebaptism just to start a, a new covenant, not entrance into the church, but a covenant that they're going to start their lives over and follow the Savior. Members of the church did this often in the early days of the church. In fact, Brigham Young had everyone who was in the Salt Lake Valley in those early years go get rebaptized. Many people walked to the Jordan River. Notice they even called it the Jordan River after that to make a new baptism to recovenant their lives to follow the Savior and, and be more righteous. Uh, currently, we don't do that. We just say, nope, just get baptized once. The only rebaptisms we do, the sacrament is a renewal of our baptismal covenant, and we go to the temple to be baptized for our kindred dead. So great things in that. Let's keep going on here. Let's go to uh, chapter 19 now. Chapter 19. Here is the story where the Lamanites are going to come attack again. But before this happens, the people start to realize that King Noah is not so righteous. In fact, but it's a lesser part. Notice verse 3. And the lesser part to began to breathe out threatenings against the king. And there began to be a great contention among them. Verse 4 introduced to a man by the name of Gideon. 
He is going to take the law into his own hands in this case. He draws his sword and he says, I'm going to go kill the king. It's the only way we're going to get uh, our society back to uh, righteousness. Now, while they're out there, the Lamanites attack. And so King Noah pleads for his own life. That's verse 8. That he says, please, Gideon, don't kill me. The Lamanites are coming. Let me go lead my people. So here is the great king, the great protector Noah. What is his plan? Verse 9. Run. That's his plan. Run. So he runs down the tower. He gets all the people. says, the Lamanites are coming. Here's our great defense military strategy. Run. And so the people flee into the wilderness with, notice the end of verse 9, their women and their children. But verse 10, a Lamanite army is going to catch up with women, children, older people. Uh, you, you can't move an entire society faster than an army can flee. It's the worst military strategy ever, and thanks to King Noah. Now, if you go to verse 11, his current military strategy didn't work. So what's his new military strategy? And it came to pass that king, the king commanded them, that all the men should leave their wives and their children and flee before the Lamanites. Great strategy. What kind of a man abandons his wife and children because times get tough? That is a painful question. And I, again, here, if you're a man and you're married and you have children and there's difficult times you're faced, uh, don't be a, a King Noah. And don't be a follower of Noah. Uh, if you have blinders on and you're following whatever you think you want to hear and see and do, I just, here's a warning straight from the Book of Mormon. Don't follow Noah's strategy and say, you know what, I'm out of here. I'm leaving my wife and kids for something more exciting or something more fun or something more safe or something, whatever it might be. Let's continue on with the story. Verse 12, there were many that would not leave them. Uh, and these are the men like Limhi. We know that Noah's own son refuses to follow his father. And there's a moment here when the blinders are coming off and they're saying, uh, no, I'm not doing that. I've followed along with the party for long enough, but this is wrong. So they leave. Now, verse 13 here is a verse that's just, I don't understand this culture. Again, I'm placing 2020, my culture, on top of theirs, but I don't understand their culture. So when the Lamanites come and attack, they're reaching them, and it came to pass. This is verse 13. Those who tarried with their wives and their children caused that their fair daughters should stand forth and plead with the Lamanites that they would not slay them. Now, I am not a warrior. I'm not a fighter. That's just not who I am. But I'm not going to stick my wife and my daughters in front of me between my enemy and me to protect me and hope that something happens. Again, where do they get that culture, that influence from? Maybe that's from Noah and they've been brought up and been following an evil culture with their blinders on for so long. But in this case, it worked. In fact, verse 14, the Lamanites were charmed with the beauty of their women. And they did take their lives, uh, and they did spare their lives, and took them captives back to the land. And you'll notice this is in verse 15. They are now going to be taxed. Remember, it says that 20% tax was a burden under King Noah. Well, when you follow sin long enough, things are always going to get worse. 50% tax now that they're going to give to the Lamanites. Now let's go down a little bit to verse 19. There are those, and it came to pass, no, verse 19. And they had sworn in their hearts that they would return to the land of Noah. This is where they have that moment that they take the blinders off and they sing King Noah for who he really is. He's a coward. He has been taxing to live on the luxury, uh, to live a luxurious life on the backs and the burdens of his own people. And the people are like, we're not going to do this. So verse 19, they make a commitment that we had sworn in their hearts that they would return to the land of Nephi. And if their wives and their children were slain, and also those that had tarried with them, they would seek revenge and also perish with them. Verse 20, 
And the king commanded them that they should not return. And they were angry with the king and caused that he should suffer even unto death by fire. So what do they do? They'll fulfill Abinadi's prophecy. They kill King Noah in the same fashion that he killed Abinadi. The blinders are off. They're now going to face the consequences of their action. They're going to return and they're going to say, okay, well, let's go find out what happened to our wives and children that we have abandoned. And we're going to try to, in the term we use with repentance, we're going to have whatever restitution we can do to make things better. Well, but the wicked of all priests, in verse 21, they were about to take the priests also and put them to death, and they fled before them. So Amulon is the leader of these wicked priests. They leave, they escape, and they will never get found. Uh, these people will come to haunt uh, people, righteous people in their past later on, just like sometimes our sins. We can truly repent, and the consequences of our sins do not go away. Again, Limhi's people goes back. They now have a worse burden. 50% pay tribute to the Lamanites, and they're in bondage to them. They really do repent. But sin, when we repent, does not instantly, though we might wash away our sins, the consequences of sin do not disappear. Let me give you some examples. I've talked with some young men who were engaged in immorality in high school, and they truly, honestly repent. And I believe they're as clean as the day they were born. But the consequences still might be there. They might not be able to serve a full-time mission. That consequence may be a reality. I know some wonderful young women who were engaged in immorality, uh, became pregnant, uh, truly have repented. I believe they're as clean as the day they were born. But the baby does not disappear just because they repent. The consequences are still there. Maybe you smoked or drank your whole life. And you repent. You were honestly as clean and pure as the day you were born. I really believe that. You still might get lung cancer or liver cancer or whatever consequence might be there. Consequences in this life do not completely disappear with repentance. However, I do believe through the power of the atonement, eventually all causes of sin, consequences of sin will be overcome. But that does not always happen in this life. And we see that. We see Limhi's people who were in sin, in bondage, and remain in bondage for some time as a consequence to their sin. Alma too. Alma was a sinner. And those who followed him, they followed Noah for a while. However, you're going to see a major difference now between Limhi and Alma. Both are in bondage to Lamanites, but Alma's people repented earlier, so their deliverance from bondage will happen sooner and easier. The sooner, again, here's a principle, the sooner we repent, a, we're not in that bondage, uh, uh, consequences are being added upon us. They're, they're gone sooner, and the deliverance is easier. I think that's true in all of our consequences. So let's take a look at a few things here. Uh, that's chapter 20, is the consequences of past sin. Uh, if we go there now, chapter 20, the Lamanite daughters that were abducted by Amulon. That's this group here. The wicked priests, they go kidnap some Lamanite daughters. Thus, the Lamanites come attack Limhi's people. And they start killing them. And Limhi's like, why are you fighting us? We have kept our promise. We've paid you the tribute. And they figure out that the consequence of having wicked people abandon them, uh, it's still causing them problems. So let's take a look at, uh, let's go to chapter 21 for a moment. Here we see Limhi's people suffer against consequences of their previous lifestyle. If you go to verse 14, this is Mosiah chapter 21, verse 14. We're going to learn a few things here. And they did humble themselves in the depths of humility. How do you get delivered from sin? and bondage, and all of these horrible things. Uh, humility is a, 
a key. And they did cry mightily to God. Yea, even all the day long they did cry unto their God, that he would deliver them out of their afflictions. 15 is an interesting principle here. If we understand verse 15, it might help us in our trials that we're currently going through. And the Lord was slow to hear their cries. Why? Because of their iniquities. Nevertheless, the Lord did hear their cries. Now, I am not one to say all of our trials in life are caused by our own iniquities. Many of mine are, but not all of them. I know a lot of people that have had cancer because of lifestyle choices. Drinkers, liver cancer. Smokers, lung cancer. Tobacco chewers, lip, gum cancer, so forth. We get that. But there's also very innocent people who might get cancer or an illness. We get sick, and that's not because of a, a, a sin. And that would not be a fair judgment. We know righteous apostles and prophets that have had illnesses, cancers, and so forth. No fault of their own. But in this case, verse 15, the Lord was slow to hear their cries. And I think sometimes we need to learn patience. We don't like to. But I think sometimes we need to learn patience. And notice what happened at the end of uh, uh, verse 15. The Lord began to soften the hearts of the Lamanites, that they began to ease their burdens. Yea, the Lord did not see to deliver them out of bondage. Again, sometimes our trials, they don't disappear. We can pray day and night. And the Lord says, you know what? I'm not going to take the trial away from you. But I will make it uh, softer, easier to to uh, bear that burden. I think there's a power in that. Verse 16, And it came to pass that they began to prosper by degrees in the land, and began to raise grain more abundantly, and flocks and herds that they did not suffer with hunger. In other words, they grew X amount of food before. Now they're being able to grow 2X amount of food. So even though they still have the burden, uh, it's it's easier to bear. I, I think there's a true principle in there. I think God does want to bear, help us with our burdens. Let me share a quote by Elder Bednar. Quote, The challenges and difficulties were not immediately removed from the people, but Alma and his followers were strengthened, and their increased capacity made the burdens lighter. These good people were empowered to act as agents and impact their circumstances and the strength of the Lord and in the strength of the Lord, Alma and his people were directed to safety in the land of Zarahemla. The unique burdens in each of our lives help us rely upon the merits, mercy, and grace of the Holy Messiah. I testify and promise the Savior will help us to bear up our burdens with ease as we are yoked with him through sacred covenants and receive his enabling power in our lives, we increasingly will seek to understand and live according to his will. We also will pray for the strength to learn from, change, or accept our circumstances, rather than praying relentlessly for God to change our circumstances according to our will. Now, this talk that Elder Bednar gave in conference in, in 2014, there's a great little video clip that you can go to YouTube or churchofjesuschrist.org. Just search Bearing Our Burdens with Hope. It's uh, eight and a half minutes. It's a great little video clip. You can have this discussion. One more thing that I think would be pa uh, powerful. Limhi's deliverance is in chapter 21 and 22. Alma's people escape in chapters 23 and 24. You could do a comparison, review those two, because they're delivered in two completely different ways, and I think there's a power in that. So if I go back to this chart here, again, Alma's deliverance is very different than Ammon, than Ammon delivering Limhi's people. So I think there's a power in going and seeing those two forms of deliverance and seeing sooner repentance leads to sooner deliverance. And it's easier. Mosiah 24, verse 13. And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them. This is Alma's group. To them, to them in their affliction, saying, Lift up your heads, be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which ye have made. 
unto me. And I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. And the and I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that ye, even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do, that ye will stand as witnesses for me hereafter, and that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And the next verse is just as good where it says, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens. Uh, you know, I remember Elder Maxwell from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and his trials and struggles, and he was made strong even though his burden never was removed. Each of us are going to go through burdens, and I believe there's some great principles in here in this content of these chapters of you're going to have your burdens, you're going to suffer, but the Lord will help you through your burdens, and eventually uh, you will be delivered from your burdens whether that's in this life or the next life. The atonement of Jesus Christ is powerful enough that all people, uh, through proper repentance and covenants, all consequences of our sins, past transgressions, or even the, just the difficulties of life that we face will someday re be removed. I testify that is true. Now, if you notice here, both groups do get delivered, and they arrive up in the land of Zarahemla, and they will be combined in one great people that they will call Nephites. And we even learn that the Mulekites are joined and with the Nephites, and Almas people, and Limhi's people, and they make up this land. We also know that down in the land of Nephi, that's where the Lamanites will be, and we, this brings us up to about 120 BC. So, you know, do the math in there. You know, we're almost 500 years since uh, Lehi left Jerusalem. And there's some great stories. This is a nice stopping point because from here on out, the story is going to get more scattered uh, and the people move around and, and, and things. But right now, you basically have your two groups, your Nephites and your Lamanites. So next week, we will pick up and we will cover Mosiah 25 through 28. Until then, enjoy your study of the Book of Mormon.